1994, the actor Kevin Bacon made a remarkable statement in an interview with Premier Magazine. He said, I've worked with everybody in Hollywood, or somebody who has worked with them. So what Bacon means to say is, in the network where notes are actors and links are co-appearances in movies, he is at most two steps away from everybody else. And people were wondering, is this even possible that somebody so close to everybody else in a fairly large network? Well, without knowing, Bacon had created the perfect storm. Everybody was interested in networks in 1994 anyway, right? This was a birth year of the World Wide Web. The internet already existed, and the internet was full of nerds, and some of them were movie nerds. This game, trying to find somebody who you couldn't connect to Bacon with a short sequence of links, this is the perfect game that all the movie nerds had been waiting for. Welcome back to Complexity Papers. This here is lecture five in the Networks and Complexity course. And this one is about the small world effect. At least in my mind, that is the most profound phenomenon in network science. Thanks to the Internet Movie Database, we can actually check Bacon's claim. Right, we find all actors, find for each one the shortest path to Bacon, and then we see if he's worked with everybody in Hollywood or somebody who has worked with them. This is a result here. Among all actors in the world, there are some that cannot be connected to Bacon, but they are mostly people who have just appeared in one TV commercial or so. The vast majority and every actor you would know really is connected to Bacon somehow. Among them, there are still some which haven't worked with Bacon himself or somebody who has worked with them, but he is surprisingly closely connected to a surprisingly large number of people. If you just go three steps from Bacon, we have covered the majority of the network already. And this is a phenomenon we are talking about today. Why is it that surprisingly many people are surprisingly close to a given source? The story of the small world doesn't really start with Kevin Bacon. Instead, it dates back to the year 1929 and the Hungarian writer Frigis Karinti. Karinti described the small world phenomenon in another way. He wasn't talking about movie actors and co-appearances in movies. No, he was talking about everybody, every person on the planet. And he was talking about social contacts. So, Karinti's claim was that in the human social network, everybody is connected to everybody else by chains of at most five intermediate people. He describes this in a short story titled Chain Links. And this story is really worth reading today because of how relevant it still is to our present world. So, by all means, I should have really shot this video in Hungary. But unfortunately, Viktor Orban's government there has made filming almost impossible. Instead, I've come to the next best place. Because here in Vienna, Austrian mathematician Manfred Kochen read Karinti's short story and was inspired to think about this mathematically. Eventually, Kochen wrote a book called Contacts and Influences, in which he describes also his theory about the small world. He gave an early version of this book to American psychologist Stanley Milgram. And this in turn made Milgram wonder, is this really true? Aren't there some big barriers in society, like geographic space, right? Or the divisions between rich and poor? Stanley Milgram made a series of experiments that showed that people often have a hard time to find the shortest connections to a target person. But they also showed that we are indeed very closely connected to almost everybody else. In Milgram's words, the five intermediaries of Carinti became six degrees of separation, six links that we need to connect to almost everybody. Obviously, the word degree here is used differently than we used it in our previous lectures. And this just happens in interdisciplinary research, right? 
there's too few words. So people use the same word in different ways. That's something we just have to put up with. But anyway, the six degrees of separation were born. Milgram's paper was very widely discussed in the media and it came to the attention of American playwright John Guare. Guare used it as a basis for a play that was performed on Broadway. And in 1994, this play was actually turned into a movie with Will Smith. In the January issue of Premier Magazine, there is a long article about this movie. So this is probably why it was in Bacon's mind when he gave this interview later that year. The 1990s is also the time when network science was born. And the analysis of the small world phenomenon by network scientists Duncan Watts and Steve Strogatz was really the first big win for network science. So, and this brings us to the present video. See what I've done there? In just six steps, we can connect your current experience to the beginnings of this phenomenon with Frigis Carinti in 1929. Note how different this is from our previous lectures. Right previously, we had precise questions where we were looking for the shortest path or something. So we had all the information, we know the network completely, and we know what we wanted to compute. The question was just how to compute the thing we were looking for in an efficient way. So these were typically computer science challenges. These are the types of questions that computer science addresses. But the present one is quite different. Now, we don't know precisely what we want to compute, right? We are not talking about computing all the distances to all the other nodes anymore. No, really, what we want to do is understand a phenomenon. Why is everybody so closely connected to everybody else? And if I say it like this, it's not even true. The first challenge that we have to address is actually finding a way to phrase this so that we have a statement that is actually true, that can be tested and explained. And if you have a problem like this, what you're doing is no longer computer science. Welcome to physics. So how do we think about this? Well, this concept of how far things are apart in a network is captured by the diameter. But the diameter of a network can be quantified in different ways. A very common way to quantify it is the length of the longest, shortest path. So what do we mean by this? Well, we consider all pairs of nodes and for each pair we find the shortest path. And then among all of these pairs we take the longest of the shortest path. The length of this path is the diameter of the network. So, for example, in this little network here, the diameter is 4. So, the short, longest, shortest path is the path from node A to node E. And it has a length 4. But there's a problem with this uh, graph theoretical definition of the diameter. See, if we adopted this definition to measure the diameter of the human social network, it could be easily manipulated. We could start a small sect, right? If my sect has just five followers, we could basically organize to say, oh, I, as a leader of the sect, will maintain contact with civilization, but then I will only have contact with one other member of the sect. And this other member of the sect will have contact with me and yet one another member of the sect. And that other member of the sect again, we'll have contact with the previous member and another one and so on. So we construct this long tail that we attach to the human social network, right? And if we are allowed to do this, right, it's clear that in this way, five people could probably increase the diameter of the human network by five or at least four or so. And we don't want this, right? We don't want to give a small sect the opportunity to change basically one of the big descriptors of how humans interact. That would be a silly definition, it would not be robust. So if you think this example of the sect is too silly, 
I would like to remind you that our movie actor network is almost like that. We haven't really computed the diameter here because we only consider distances from Kevin Bacon. But you can guess that this one person who is at distance 10 from Bacon also alone increases the diameter of the movie actor network according to this definition by one. A solution to problems like this that is at the very heart of statistical physics is to talk about averages instead of pathological examples. Right? The longest path in the network that is a pathological object because by its very nature it's a very weird path. On the other hand, the average path length makes much more sense. It's a typical property that describes the network. So let's take a moment to recap how we compute averages. And yes, for most people this will be very basic, but still it's worth considering because there's actually something interesting to discover here when we talk about paths. But first, how do we compute an average? Well, if we want to average some numbers, right, we sum them up and then divide by the number of numbers. Okay, so for instance, in a network, we can compute the mean degree, right? To do this, we sum up all the node degrees and then we divide by the number of nodes. That gives us a mean degree, which we commonly call z. In our little example network, we can just make a list of all pairs of nodes. And for each of the pairs, we now compute the shortest path and then sum up the length of all of the shortest paths. Then I divide by the number of pairs of nodes. So this gives me also a quantification of a diameter. And of course, this average path length will always be less than the longest path length that we find in the network, right? But for the small example, computing this version of the diameter is almost silly, right? Because this average length of a path is not very informative in a network that has so few paths. Because if it has so few paths, all the paths are really distinct, right? One path of length one is very different from the path of length four, right? So these average measures they have the opposite problem. They make sense for large networks, but not for small ones. So we have two different ways of constructing meaningful diameters. The diameter as shortest path length makes a lot of sense in the small network where all the details matter. But the diameter of average path length is much more useful in the large network where we don't want details to matter. And this is actually a very common observation in complex systems. At different scales, we need to measure different things to arrive at a meaningful theory. So to deal with larger networks, let's write a mathematical formula for the diameter in terms of distances between nodes, so it means in terms of average shortest path lengths. So how do we do this? Well, basically, we have to consider the distances between pairs or nodes. And we can write these distances just as dij, as we did in the previous lectures. And then we need to sum over all of these distances. So we can just take the sum over all nodes i and the sum over all nodes j. However, in the computation of the diameter, it's common that we don't consider the distances from a node to itself. So commonly, we sum over all nodes i, but then consider the sum over all j that is not equal to i. So um, this gives us a sum. And now we need to divide by the number of terms we summed, which in this case is n number of nodes times n minus 1. Note that this calculation is actually slightly different from what we did in the small example. And the reason is that in the small example, it was convenient to consider the distance between each pair of nodes only once. And here in the big one, for convenience of mathematical notation, we are actually considering the distance in both ways. As long as we divide by the correct number of terms, the result is actually the same. So this doesn't make a difference. Just don't get confused by it. In this equation, 
we can actually move around things a little bit. And in particular, I want to arrange them like this. So why would we do this? Well, look at the second sum now. This second sum now looks like an average in itself. So what's the meaning of this? Well, see, it's the average of the distance between all other nodes J and one particular node I. Oh, that is the distance that everybody else is from node I. Nice. Now, what about the outer sum? The outer sum is now also an average. It's basically averaging this distance to node I over all the nodes I in the network. So we started out writing an equation for the average length of shortest path in the network. But now it turns out this average length of shortest path, that is also the average distance between a typical node in the network and everybody else. It's very common in network science that one value has two different interpretations. For, for instance, we often have the eagle's eye interpretation, where the value is interpreted as a average over the whole network. On the other hand, we can also use a more egocentric interpretation of the same number, which is then the typical experience of an average node. The diameter is an example of this, but also the mean degree. We can think of the mean degree as the average number of links per node, and that is the eagle's eye perspective. But we can also think of the mean degree as the expected number of links that we find on a randomly picked node. And that is a more egocentric perspective. Very often, switching between these two perspectives allows us to make progress. For example, if we adopt the eagle's eye perspective, it's very hard to compute the mean degree of the human social network. We just can't count all the number of nodes and links in this network. However, if we adopt the egocentric perspective, we can compute this number, because then we just have to compute the expectation value for the number of social contacts per person. So we can just pick some people at random from the population and find out how many social contacts they have. And this will give us a very good estimate for the mean degree of the network. So these were some preliminaries, but now it's really time that we get back to our small world phenomenon. But I have to warn you, we are now going to make a little calculation that some people will find very easy and some people will find very difficult. The reason is that we are now doing physics and this involves modeling. And modeling does not only need mathematical skill. Modeling needs courage. Because in modeling, you have to first trust your model and explore it to the fullest extent before you come and challenge it. So I'm going to build on some assumptions that many people will find hard to believe because they are actually wrong. Still, can you trust my assumptions enough to understand the implications for the model? Because this is a skill that you need to be a good physicist. You need to be able to suspend your disbelief in the model. So let's try to work out the number of nodes that we expect to find at a given distance from a randomly chosen node. So if you randomly choose a node, we can be pretty sure that there is exactly one node at distance zero from this randomly chosen node. That was easy. How about distance one? Well, one of the assumptions we are going to make is that the number of nodes I find attached to it is the mean degree. And in average, I'm pretty sure this is correct. So at distance one from a randomly chosen node, I expect to find Z nodes. And I take this mean degree Z to be three in this example. Okay, good. We now know the number of nodes at distance zero and at distance one. What about distance two? Let's assume that we find Z additional nodes attached to each of these nodes that we found at distance one. This is another assumption we are making, but this one will also be very good. I promise, and we're going to see this in the next lecture. So the number of nodes at distance two is Z squared. Well, 
there's another big assumption here, right? And this assumption is that these new links that start from the nodes at distance one don't lead to other nodes of distance one. So the assumption is they lead to new nodes, which means we are assuming that there are no short cycles in the network. This is called a tree-like assumption. Well, and it's a big ask, right? Because in social networks, this is plainly not true. All social networks, almost without exception, have many short cycles. So if we, if we roll with this, right? If we just continue the sequence, we can see that the number of nodes that we expect to find at a distance d from our randomly chosen node is z to the d. We can use this relationship to estimate the diameter of the network. For a very rough estimate, we can just set the number of nodes that we want to reach to n, the total number of nodes in the network, and the number of steps that we need to reach them, well, that is then our estimate for the diameter d. Now, all we need to do is to solve this equation for the d. And the way to do this is to take the logarithm with base z on both sides. So we get that the estimate for the diameter is logarithm with base z of the number of nodes. Using the rules for logarithms, we can rewrite this in terms of natural logarithms. And this gives us this. The estimate for the diameter is a natural logarithm of the number of nodes divided by the natural logarithm of the mean degree z. Just for the fun of it, let's put in some typical numbers for the human social network. The number of social links that humans typically maintain is called Dunbar's number. And Dunbar's number is about 100. And the number of humans on Earth is about 10 billion. So, what is log 100 of 10 billion? Well, 100 to the power of 1 is 100. To the power of 2, it's 10,000. To the power of 3, it's 1 million. To the power of 4, it's 100 million. And to the power of 5, it's 10 billion. So log 100 of 10 billion is 5. So we just need 5 steps to reach everybody. Not 6 degrees of separation, only 5. So what have we achieved? Well, so far, we have a quick little formula that allows us to have a quick and very dirty estimate for the diameter of networks. But this is useful stuff. In the second part of this video, we will examine things more carefully and we will question all the assumptions and do some tests with real data. But before that, I need you to do some exercises to basically internalize this way of thinking. So let's see you all in the exercises and then we will do things more carefully in part two.